Edit audio. This podcast discusses murder and violence against children. Please take care while listening. In the last episode of the Feeney Family Murders, we laid out the crime scene and the possibility that it could have been staged. And there's a lot of sickness in murder, particularly a murder like this, because it was just so strange and creepy and staged. I said all the pictures were turned towards the wall, pillows over their heads. That is a telltale sign of somebody that had had a relationship. Now, I want to know why someone would do this, and most importantly, who. This is the Feeney Family Murders, an Ozark's true crime story, and I'm your host, Ann Roderick Jones. I think now might be a good time to tell you about who the Feenies were. I should note that throughout this series, we're going to talk a lot about the Feenies, John in particular. We're going to examine him and his life, not only because he's a complicated man, but because he was the one and only suspect in this case. Ultimately, we want to know if it's possible that he committed this crime. Cheryl Lynn Hash and John Edward Feeney were married on June 6, 1981, at the Camdenton Church of Christ. John's father officiated the wedding. The announcement says that Cheryl wore a traditional white dress, trimmed with Chantilly lace, and carried roses, carnations, and valley lilies. Her three bridesmaids were sky blue and carried blue and white flowers. Steve Chodrick was the best man, along with two other groomsmen. If you remember, Steve was the one who was with John the day they found out about the homicides. At the time of the wedding, John was a senior at Oklahoma Christian College, and Cheryl had just graduated from nursing school. They had met a decade earlier at a trauma center where John was an attendant and Cheryl was a receptionist. He said in an interview with Ron Davis in the Springfield News Leader in 1995 that the work wasn't super fascinating to him, but that's where he would meet the receptionist, Cheryl Hash. Cheryl was attending nursing school at the time, and John described her as very quiet, very beautiful. She had a trim build with carefully styled brown short hair that curled above her shoulders and kind smiling eyes. John said that their relationship started out with that eye thing. This was quoted in a newspaper when he spoke to a journalist about his wife after her death. I'm not 100% sure what that eye thing is, but he went on to say that they'd look at each other. After, they started talking, and eventually the two began eating together in the work cafeteria. One night, a co-worker threw a party, and Cheryl asked John to dance. That may sound like typical crush behavior for two people, but John grew up in the Church of Christ, where dancing was forbidden. Still, he said yes. That night, they stayed out past her midnight college curfew and drove around talking. He recalls that at one point, they stopped along the side of a farm road, turned on the radio, and got out of the car and started dancing. This initial reporting from Ron Davis has been a big part of learning about who John and Cheryl were as a young couple. And while poring over all of these newspaper archives can be tedious and time-consuming, it's been essential for covering this case. Reading these articles, this all sounds so sweet and innocent, like the beginning of a young love story. After getting married, the couple lived in a one-bedroom apartment until John finished his undergraduate degree, and they moved to Stillwater, Oklahoma, where he began pursuing a degree in biochemistry. Cheryl worked at a medical center. They bought their first home for $35,000 that John described as having neat floors and tiles. They got a cat that John had rescued from a brush pile. A 1995 article that came out shortly after the murders described the couple's initial decision to have children— and Cheryl's decision to actively stop taking birth control. John says, when that happened, they started trying for Tyler. He describes taking the pregnancy test together and that they were both overjoyed. At this point, John is 30 and Cheryl is 31, and they have a baby boy. They spend Sundays looking at open houses for their dream home, and they find it in 1990, a new build with a walkout basement on Nottingham Street for just under $100,000. They got to pick out the tiles, the paint, the curtains. 
John was teaching at Glendale High School and being lauded as one of the most well-regarded science teachers in the Ozarks. Jackie Shrivener was an English teacher at Glendale High School. He seemed to be interested in different types of strategies. He taught a classroom control in one of those. I mean, let's face it, you have to control your classroom or it's chaos. And that was one of the things he talked about, how to control the students when things got out of hand. The kids seemed to like him. Janet was one of John Feeney's students at Glendale, and she asked that we only use her first name. I do definitely remember him having more of a casual and laid-back approach, treating us, talking to us like, you know, like, I'm not a regular mom, I'm the cool mom, like, sort of that kind of vibe of, like, I'm trying to be the cool teacher and and one who's on more friendly, casual terms with students than a, a more of an air of authority, I would say. Jackie told me that John started a teacher's volleyball team at the school. Jackie joined the team, but said that she wasn't very good and that John didn't let her play very often. Mr. Prouty, who was the other one, who was a special ed teacher at that time, and we were both the two worst players on the team. And uh, John wanted to win, you know, the tournaments. We didn't win a single game. But sometimes he, he was reluctant to rotate either Mr. Prouty or myself, into the team. And I just finally one time said, John, I paid my fee like everyone else. Let me in. Let me play. Jackie told me that she never really saw John and Cheryl together, that she didn't really know much about Cheryl. And as far as she could recall, Cheryl didn't attend their volleyball games or the school's social events. That was an interesting thing. He didn't talk about his wife a lot. The little boy, he talked about quite a bit. I don't want to make too much of this, as Cheryl was a highly respected nurse leading the gynecological team at Cox Hospital and was a busy woman. But Jackie isn't the first to mention not knowing much about her. While researching for this story, we spoke to dozens of people who knew the Feenies, and time and time again, Cheryl comes out as a bit of an enigma, as someone who was guarded, especially with her personal life. After a lot of digging, I was able to find Cheryl's older brother, Doug. He lives in Camdenton, Missouri, with his mother, Lynn Hash. I was hoping that, through them, I could learn more about Cheryl's life. On a warm, sunny Saturday morning, our team drove to their home, a simple white house with pretty blue shutters, to speak with Cheryl's family. Do you think I can park behind their truck? Yeah, I think so. Wow, this is a really cute house. It's a really cute the house. Blue shutters. Well, the blue shutters. Yeah. Oh, true. Blue shutters, white siding. All right, let's chat with Doug and Lynn. I sat down with Doug in the basement of his home. It's filled with guitars and other musical instruments. He owned a music store for many years and told me that sadly, because of the distance between him and Cheryl and owning the music shop, he didn't get to see his sister that often. And it was a long time before I really got to know anything about Cheryl because we're both so busy with our two different lives and eight and a half years apart. Cheryl was adopted as a baby and grew up in Camdenton, Missouri. Her mom, Lynn, and her brother, Doug, still live there today. Doug was about eight years old when his parents brought Cheryl home. I remember them telling me that uh, that finally the papers did go through and I was going to have a sister. And yeah, it was uh, it was kind of fun watching her start to grow up from a little one-year-old baby and then starting to walk. And and Cheryl and I would rough house in the house a little bit until Grandpa said quit it. According to Doug, Cheryl mostly ran around with her best friend Debbie as a child. Debbie passed away, so we were unable to speak with her. Do you um, remember meeting John? I think I only met John maybe even at the, the wedding ceremony. It might have been a little bit before, but it was very infrequent. And I was uh, pretty shocked at the wedding when I saw who John was and looked at him. And I thought, she's going to marry that guy. She just, it, it didn't look like the kind of guy that I thought Cheryl would marry. What was the type of guy you thought Cheryl would marry? I thought he would be a little more handsome, trimmer. John just didn't look like he had much on the ball. 
When I look back on this conversation, it seems wild to me that Doug didn't meet John until their wedding day. They'd been together for a decade. What was the wedding like for you and your family? I have never ha- experienced this feeling before, but when she married John, I wanted to get out of that building the church. I was angry inside because I guess I felt he he just wasn't the right guy. And I've never had a feeling that strong, but it was just like she married the wrong guy. I just had, and somebody, one of my uncles that was at the wedding asked me, Doug, what's wrong with you? And I said, I just got to get out of here. I was angry, and I, the only thing I can tell you is I just felt that he wasn't the right guy, and I have never had a feeling like that before or after. But I just felt that, and that was an odd feeling for me. But, uh, yeah, I, I never felt that he was the right guy for Cheryl. He just uh, didn't, they didn't seem to fit. John Edward Feeney was born February 16, 1960, in Meeker, Oklahoma, His father was a pastor, and the family moved around a bit, until they settled in Springfield when John was in sixth grade. Though he was tall, he wasn't an athlete, more of a smart kid who lived under the roof of his religious parents. He said in an article in April of 1995 that he had a happy childhood. John went on to major in chemistry at Oklahoma Christian College, but wasn't entirely sure what he wanted to do as a career. To help paint a picture— John is a white man, about six foot three, of average to heavier build, with shaggy brown hair and a mustache. He wore large glasses that you'd often see in the 1970s. Here's Jackie again. He had a good personality. John could be charming and he could be he could be fun to talk to. He wasn't that good looking, really. He frequently wore glasses and he was Not fat, but he wasn't. He didn't have a good physique either. The thing that I noticed about him, I think that he was dedicated to making things better in the teaching situation. You know, I just felt like he would have made a good president of the teachers' association. He was he was just friendly and easy to get along with. After digging into John's career at Glendale, it started to feel like he had two personalities. While some teachers would describe him as brilliant and charming, others would say that he was narcissistic, lazy, and standoffish. There are so many strange things. It's almost like you're dealing with two people in one, you know. And while researching this case, some of his former students began to tell me their stories. Jennifer had John as a teacher for advanced chemistry and was a teaching assistant in one of his classes. They would chat a lot after class. I was in the process of applying for college, so, you know, I just remember talking with him about what I was applying for and what I wanted to study and and just things going on in life generally. So definitely found him to be an approachable person and, and absolutely had conversations with him outside of class, would stay late or come in at different times to say hello. At first, their relationship seemed friendly and jovial, but Jennifer noticed a shift at a certain point. It's funny, this many years back, what I remember is how things made me feel. And I remember the comments that he would make about, you know, occasionally they weren't frequent, but if anything ever came up about his family or his family life, he quickly shot it down and made it clear that he had, he kind of took no joy in being a father, or being a husband. I remember thinking, wow, that's so, so strange, right? And then, you know, other conversations, it was more things that, um, you know, he was very casual with us. And then things that he asked me to do when I graduated, he was teaching some kind of a summer class, I thought, I think it was in biology. He took the students to the zoo or the class itself was at the, the Dickerson Park Zoo in Springfield. And he asked me if I could go and help a couple of times and I would show up and there was absolutely nothing for me to do. I I have no idea why he had asked me, at least now, you know, I do now. He also, after showing up a a couple of times there, he said, well, let me thank you. Let's, I'll take you to the movies. Let's go see a movie together. And I thought, oh, you know, that's, um, 
that's unusual. <laughs> and I never, I never took him up on it, thankfully, because I, I definitely now looking back, I think, oh, now I see what he was actually trying to do and that he was being incredibly inappropriate with a student. And thankfully, you know, that, that gut feeling that I had got me out of a situation that could have gotten really horrible really quick. Jill Williams was a former Glendale student who took the stand at his trial. She said that Feeney had invited her and two other young women to Columbia, Missouri for an expense-paid football weekend. The three women went with Feeney and two of his friends. She testified that there was no sexual intercourse, but that Feeney had called their room at one point and asked if they were ready to go to the game, and if they were naked. And then there was the camping trip. I spoke with a woman who asked to remain anonymous, who told me about a camping trip that John Feeney went on with some of his students a few days after graduation. So we planned a camping trip, and there were probably four carloads of students, and it was post-graduation, so it had no affiliation with the high school. I want to say it was like just a few days after graduation, and it was really limited to the students in Mr. Feeney's class. It's not clear who planned the trip, but this woman seemed to think that John had some part in organizing it. I kind of feel like it might have been Mr. Feeney, but I don't know. But we went to like four different locations. We went to some state parks, and then at some point we ended up at a place that had cabins. So, you know, as kids, we're not thinking anything of it. We're just going, we're putting up tents. The trip was set to be four nights and five days. John Feeney had driven his own car alongside three or four carloads of students. Partway through the trip, the campers noticed the start of an inappropriate relationship between John Feeney and one of the students. Towards the middle of the trip, we noticed that he started to be a a really, what we all felt was an inappropriate relationship with one of the students. They would go off together in the woods, and then she started riding in his car, and then they would disappear. You know, we all tried to stay together, and she would be in his convertible Mustang, and they would just take off while we were going to the next campground. And, you know, we we confronted her and said, what are you doing? Yeah, this is crazy. And it was even more, it was more the fact, even if I remember, it wasn't even necessarily that he was a teacher, but she was really a beautiful girl, very popular, very, very beautiful girl. And we just thought he was a big dork. And what was she doing with, you know, a dorky guy more than, you know, I look back now and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, how inappropriate. And she had shared with me and another girl that they had, they were intimate and we were trying to keep her away from him. This was a story I heard a lot while researching this case, but none of this was brought up in the trial. I don't think anyone had spoken about it until now. It was always mentioned that John Feeney had been in a relationship with a student, but it wasn't clear who. After digging around, I found out the name of this former student who John had allegedly been having sex with. And for the sake of her privacy, I'm not going to say her name or her occupation, but she's not returned my calls. And I get that. If she did have a relationship with John during this time, maybe she's just trying to forget this part of her life. To round out my research, I wanted to speak with a male student, someone who had John Feeney as a teacher, to see about their experience. I found Rob who wants to go only by his first name and agreed to let me recap our phone conversation. Rob told me that he had John Feeney as a teacher and had a good relationship with him. He even asked John to write his college recommendation letter. He said that Feeney was one of the younger teachers who had an easy relationship with his students. He also told me that John Feeney had a relationship with a female student that he said would now have sent him to jail. Rob said that he found out about this when he was in a group project in advanced chemistry with another high-achieving female student. She told Rob that she was sure she'd get an A in the class because she knew about the sexual relationship between John Feeney and another female student, and that she was holding it over his head. It seemed wild to me that a teacher could have a relationship with a student, let alone one that so many others had known about. I've heard about adults grooming younger people to be silent about abuse, and that often kids doubt their ability to recognize it. So I could understand why these students never seemed to go to the principal or the police. I asked Rob if he knew why they didn't contact authorities, and he told me that he had no idea. Here's Janet again. We heard from her earlier. 
She's a former student and is now a professor. The stories that I started to hear from students, I will say my perception now, given both my profession and the awareness and experiences that that I have seen professionally about how people who are being exploited or people who are being groomed perhaps for inappropriate relationships. In the 80s and 90s, I think there was a real culture of silence. There was a like, you know, we don't want to say bad things about people. We don't necessarily, we don't want to embarrass people. So the friends who I have talked to who either heard rumors or directly observed inappropriate things that were happening, the conversations that I have had with them lead me to think that people kept quiet in part because they were embarrassed, in part because they didn't want to embarrass other people who may have been participants in activities, whether that be drinking, whether that be inappropriate contact between an adult and a high school age student. But, you know, we can convince ourselves that maybe it wasn't what I thought or maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought. But then as more and more anecdotes and stories start coming to the surface, you begin to realize that, you know, silence protects the abuser and protects the person who is exploiting others. So... The funeral of Cheryl, Tyler, and Jennifer Feeney was held on March 3, 1995, with a visitation the previous evening. Teresa, Cheryl's friend and co-worker that we heard from previously, had saved a flyer from the memorial service. It had a scroll flanked by two doves. I found the obituary in the newspaper archives, and there's no denying that it's heartbreaking. There are images of a smiling Cheryl, who is just 36, and her two young children, The obituary states that in lieu of flowers, donations could be made to help find those responsible for the murder. It also explicitly states that the caskets will remain closed at all times. The day after the funeral, John Feeney was called in for questioning. So far, there have been no arrests in the case, and police say the only suspect in the killings is John Feeney. In the next episode, John hires a lawyer, moves back home, and the town becomes divided. He's living in the house, which was another instance where people went, how can you do that? And Feeney's point was, it was our house. Where else am I going to live? Never mind that the house was this crime scene. I don't know how you could go back to a house where your family was wiped out and not walk one step in any direction and realize everything you've lost. Somehow he was able to do that. Feeney Family Murders is part of the Edit Audio original series, Ozark's True Crime. It is written and hosted by me, Anne Roderick Jones. This episode was produced by Ali Sirwa and Kathleen Specker and was edited, mixed, and mastered by Ali Sirwa. Our executive producer is Steph Colburn. Thank you immensely to the entire Edit Audio team and Patrick Rendell for the theme music. To those who generously shared their time and information with me, thank you. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at hello at editaud.io. That's H-E-L-L-O at E-D-I-T-A-U-D dot I-O.